My name is Don Bedard, and what I'm here to do is to talk a little bit about the Microsoft clients and how they function in an IPv6 environment. The goal is not to give you or tell you this is what you should do, but to give you the information to make educated decisions. A lot of times when you go to training for IPv6, you will hear people talk about, oh, this was implemented by Apple or Linux, and Microsoft did it differently. And Microsoft did it differently for a very valid reason, not necessarily just to be different or just to be difficult. So I want to go through and talk about some of the things that were, uh, where you will hear people say, hey, Microsoft did it differently, and explain why Microsoft did it differently. All right? So let me find page down. There we go. OK, so to start off with, all Microsoft products since Vista have been released with IPv6 enabled. <clears throat> so what that means is, by default, it is preferred and it is available to you. IPv6 is on all of the systems. Oh, look, it's down there, too. OK. <laughs> it's right there. All right, so it is available uh, for all the operating systems. If you are running something that is older than IPv6, we highly recommend that you upgrade. As most of you are aware, XP support was stopped in April, and one of the big reasons and motivations for upgrading your applications and your op operating system is to get the IPv6 uh, support that's available to you. Now, we've heard a little bit about Slack already, so stateless auto configuration. And what we want to talk about with Slack is uh, when you go look at your client, and um, you know, this was brought up from a security aspect, you go look in and you look at, in my example, I have a DOS prompt, and I've done an IP config slash all, and if you look at it, you'll see that you have three addresses that are configured. You have an IPv6 address, which is, which is your Slack address, you have a temporary IPv6 address, which is kind of a Microsoft-centric thing. And you have your link local address. Now, how do you know that a client is going to configure itself for Slack? This has to do with what you have set up on your router advertisements and your ABIT. Your ABIT advertises the prefix that the client will use, but it also tells the client what he can do with that prefix. So is the client allowed to configure an address? Or is he not going to configure an address? So this is important when you start setting up your network and setting up your environment. <clears throat> if a client receives multiple advertisements with multiple network prefixes, then he starts looking at the router lifetime. So that's something when you're setting up, again, your environment, you want to take a close look at is what's being advertised and so you know what the client will prefer and what the client will look at. So again, when you're setting up Slack, the client knows that he is allowed to, at, to set up an address based on the ABIT. What prefix he has will tell him what address he can set up and what he's supposed to do with it. Typically speaking, you might want to also set the OBIT. The OBIT is for other configuration. And these are things such as your DNS servers, your domains, the options that are available within IPv6. Okay, so let's go back to this temporary IPv6 address that Microsoft has set up. <clears throat> what is the temporary IPv6 address? Well, a temporary IPv6 address is randomly generated and it changes over time. Okay, it basically takes that public prefix that the client knows that he has and then he changes it. So why did Microsoft do it? Well, I think Chris did a really good example good explanation for that. If you have your Slack address, it is based on the EUI64. EUI64 is based on your MAC address. That now makes it traceable. So from a security perspective, you may think, I don't want to be traced throughout the world as I hop around and I go to different websites, which you can if you use a standard one. So Microsoft has this pref created this temporary IP address that can be used. After a valid lifetime, which can be set up, you can now go out and it will change it again and it will keep moving it around. Now be aware, with you when you have these three addresses, your Slack, your link local, and your temporary, all three will work on the network. All three of them are perfectly valid and can receive and send traffic. From a 
network traceability and a client traceability aspect of it, it makes it a little more difficult. So you may go back and you may say, okay, well, I have all these addresses. What do I do with it? I know. I am going to go to my managed DHCP or stateful DHCP. When you go to managed DHCP or stateful DHCP, what you're basically saying is, I'm going to take this client and I'm going to give him an IP address from a known DHCP server. The idea being, I now have traceability. I can be able to follow this down to a identity and be able to track the person who's using this address. Well, when you go to set this up, you want to be careful because if you're not, you can end up with four addresses. So the whole plan of going to managed or stateful DHCP just went out the window because you went from having three addresses to now having four addresses. You will have a link local address. You will have a managed DHCP address, you will have a Slack address, and you will have your temporary address. So what you want to make sure of is when you decide, if you decide that you want to go to a managed DHCP, that you turn off the other elements. That means you need to turn off the A bit so you're not advertising a prefix. That means the client won't generate his own address. You want to make sure you turn on the M bit and turn on the OBIT for the other DHCP options if you want to pass something other than just a prefix to the client. Okay. Oops. Okay, so if you have multiple addresses in your environment, one of the questions that you have is which address is going to be used? So we've mentioned that you know, if you have Slack, you'll have three addresses. If you have managed DHCP, you potentially could have four addresses, in which case you could actually possibly end up with more. But you have four addresses. So which address is used? Well, there is this beautiful RFC that out there that will allow, will tell you, thank you very much, that will tell you what addresses will be used, and it will give you the policy. So 6724, if you're ever really tired and you need something to do and you're really bored sitting in an airport or something, it's a great RFC to read. And it goes through and sets up for you the guidelines of how a client will determine which of those addresses he prefers when he's sending traffic. Now remember, all of them are still active. All of them can still if you get on your router and you query, you can still find all of these addresses in the routing tables. But some of you will find one that is preferred over the other ones. And I'm not going to go through um, all of the rules that are available for you. I basically tried to summarize them from the RFC. The important thing to remember on this, though, is that this process can change based on an application. So the application developers can take these rules and follow them as they are laid out, but they can also take them and change them, depending on what the application is doing and what their goal is. So that is something else to keep in mind as you go through. Another topic that is near and dear to everybody's heart has to do with uh, link local multicast name resolution. So what this is, is it basically on an IPv6 network, you want to find all the hosts that are local and close to you. You may not have a DNS server on that local one. So it will use LMNR to go out and try to find other hosts on the network. Think of it like the old NetBIOS in the old days, right? NetBIOS wasn't DNS, but it helped find clients on the local network. You're not crossing boundaries. It is included with Windows Vista and later products. Uh, it responds both UDP and TCP, port 5355, so it does on the local network. It is not MDNS. It is not compatible with MDNS. So there is a difference there between them. Okay? But just so that you are aware, um, Microsoft products do use LMNR instead of using MDNS. We've heard a lot in the last couple days about dual stacking. We've heard preferences for, preferences against. Uh, things to think about, though, uh, from our perspective on dual stacking, uh, 
applications start having issues when they go between IPv4, IPv6, which application is going to use what protocol, how are they going to communicate with each other. And so we have happy eyeballs, right? That was the RFC that was put out there for everybody to try and help the process along to make it easier so you didn't get thrashing, so that the applications worked nicer, everybody was happy. The problem with happy eyeballs is that uh, it's, again, very application specific. Every application has to implement it and has to, decide, has to decide how they are going to implement it. Firefox, Chrome, some of those, yes, they've implemented. Microsoft has taken a different stance on this. And this is another one of those when you hear them, yes, Firefox, Chrome did this, and Microsoft did this. One of the reasons Microsoft took a different stance is they look at this solution as more of a short-term solution. As the environment is migrating between IPv4 and IPv6, you need some sort of transition technology. However, as you get more and more in the direction of IPv6, then you really don't need it as much. So what Microsoft wanted to do was to find a longer-term solution than just happy eyeballs because there's a lot of applications in the Microsoft environment, and if they all had to go back and change it, it would take a lot of time. So they wanted to find a different solution. So what Microsoft did is they came up with this concept that basically when a client, and this is more from an operating system perspective, when a client gets on the network and he starts to communicate out there, he will attempt to, decide, to determine whether he can use IPv6 or not. If he finds that he has traffic and he can communicate on, with IPv6 across the network, then IPv6 becomes preferred and they will communicate using IPv6 first. If the client finds that it cannot communicate via IPv6 across the network, then it goes back and it says, okay, IPv4 is my preferred route, and he will use IPv4 first. Okay? So it's really trying to determine, is IPv6 functioning? Not just is IPv6 configured, but is it actually functioning? Do I have route, routes out to the internet using it? Okay. Starting with Windows 8, it will try to connect to ipv6.msftncsi.com. And that's how it makes the determination as to whether it can communicate and whether IPv6 is actually functioning or not. That information is actually cached for about 30 days, and then it will go back and it will try again. And yes, you can clear the cache on that one. Now, Teredo, we've talked a little bit about Teredo in other presentations. Teredo is a tunneling technology. Basically, it allows you to take, if you have IPv6, and it allows you to communicate with everybody else. Microsoft has included Teredo functionality uh, by default in a default configuration since Vista. So if you have anything from Vista forward, then you have Teredo, and it's configured by default. Um, it will use tunnels before IPv4 when you have IPv6 specific applications. A lot of enterprise environments have decided that they can go out and they can block the firewalls and block Teredo traffic, and that's fine. Uh, just be aware that if you, uh, you want to block the firewalls and you want to prevent that traffic going out there, that works perfectly well. But because the application is, has, or the operating system has Teredo configured by default as part of it, you really don't want to go out and try to remove it or uninstall it. You can disable it. But re keep in mind that everything since Vista Forward has IPv6 in it, if you start trying to remove some of those pieces, you may get uh, unexpected results in your operating system. So disable it if you would like, just don't try to remove it is basically what we're trying to say. Now why do I bring up Teredo? Well, the reason I bring up Teredo is because Xbox, there's the Xbox slide. So Xbox One and Xbox utilizes IPv6 plus IPsec. 
And the idea is that with IPv6 and IPsec, that you would have a more secure peer-to-peer -peer environment. Okay? But IPv6 is not always necessarily available in all the environments, in which case it will utilize Teredo. So Xbox has a set of Teredo servers on the public internet that the Xbox clients will communicate with. Okay? If you're an ISP or you're an enterprise that happens to have Xbox systems in your environment, some things that you want to keep in mind is providing IPv6 is very desirable because that's what it was designed for. You want to make sure you allow IPsec in the environment. Um, it will provide a better experience for the end user. You want to make sure you support the outbound UDP. Um, and again, you want to make sure you support Teredo because Teredo traffic, it does prefer port 3074. Uh, and if you allow that traffic through, it will make the whole Xbox experience better for the end users. The last thing that I want to bring up is Skype. There's been a lot of comments and examples of how Skype <laughs> doesn't work real well in IPv6. <laughs> we know. OK. So Skype is actively working on the 464 XLAC for older versions of Android. OK. Um, that's pre-44 KitKat and the Samsung X3. They're also working with uh, Windows Phone and iPhone. Okay, so that that's we're actively working. It's coming. Um, IPv6 Wi-Fi is in development. It's on the active roadmap. It, everybody knows it needs to be fixed and it needs to work. So it's actively being worked from that aspect. Okay. All right. That's all I had. Hola. Eh, ¿Alguna pregunta para nuestra amiga Dom, quien ha hecho un excelente trabajo, a terrific job. Thank you so much for presenting this. In fact, I believe I learned a lot. I do have, I used to have so many doubts about how Windows handles IPv6. Uh, we have a question in line. Lee Howard, Time Warner Cable. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, always glad to see. Uh, how much support there is. Uh, when you described the connectivity check, when a client goes and, and tests to the, the website that you, uh, or the, the server that you mentioned, to verify whether IPv6 is working, is that a simple yes, no test, or is there a performance parameter that it also has to meet? Does it have to be within a certain speed of the IPv4 performance, for instance, for v6 to be preferred? No, it doesn't do a performance test. OK. Um, can I ask a follow-up question, which is, um, if I may, can you comment on uh, Microsoft's website's support, all of the sites? Comment in what way? Many of them used to support IPv6 and no longer do have quad A's. When will we see IPv6 on Microsoft.com and updates.microsoft.com? That is actively being worked right now. OK. Thank you. ¿Alguna otra pregunta? Well, I, I do have a huge I always write, write, write something down just to, to prevent if the audience do not make questions. Um, well, at the beginning, in, in Microsoft and in most operating system, you, you traditionally used e, 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 U, e, e, U, I 64 to auto-configure your IPv6 address. Uh, you said that now you are using a temporary address that I guess it is using some own Microsoft algorithm to get the IPv6 address. Can, if, you, if, can, if you remember, when did you, when you, when did you start to use the, your own algorithm to get the IPv6 address? Since ever, or maybe since Windows 8? I don't know. Effectively since Vista forward. So when they started generating, um, when they started fully supporting IPv6? No. When, when did you start to use your own algorithm to auto-configure the IPv6 address? And you are not using EIU any longer? 
EUI 64 is still used for Slack. That's not changed. The temporary address is Microsoft's algorithm. And it's a preferred address. That is oh. the. Yeah. Okay, I got it. You are still having both in, in the computer. Yes, you still have both. Okay. Alguna pregunta? Alguien del público? Bueno, eh, una pregunta más en, en, en español. Eh, bueno, recuerdo que desde hace mucho tiempo ustedes tienen Teredo también habilitado por defecto dentro del sistema operativo. Hablando del mundo de Windows y no de Xbox. Hablando del mundo de, de Windows. Teredo va, ha, ha ido bajando, claro, ahora con Xbox no sé qué ocurre. Eh, eh, Teredo ha ido bajando lentamente en, en, en el uso mundialmente. O en algún momento han pensado, quizás la respuesta no, no exista ni siquiera, pero en algún momento han pensado en, de, en, en no usarlo más, en depreciarlo, en que no exista en vez de en el sistema operativo. Yes. Okay. <risa> eh, bueno, entonces una pregunta del público, una presentación muy interesante que tuvimos. Bueno, en ese caso, agradezco una vez más a Dom, genial la presentación, sumamente buena. Y bueno, la buena noticia también es que estamos libres para ir al break, así que disfruten eso.